I'm Dr. Dan Undersander, Extension Research Forage Agronomist with the University of Wisconsin, and we're going to talk today a little bit about managing pasture to try to get the most out of it that we can. Uh, this is a, generally a tremendously underutilized resource in the region and one that uh, we should think about managing for uh, higher yield and more animal and better animal performance. So the first thing that we have to do is decide <clears throat> what are we trying to do with our pasture? Are we really trying to get nutrition from it or is it just an exercise paddock? And generally a rule of thumb would be <clears throat> that all animals, whether it's sheep, cattle, horses, whatever, uh, eat at about the same rate per body weight. And so our recommendation is that we stock at about a thousand pounds per two acres, at least to start, to give us a little bit of uh, uh, slack in case uh, some things go wrong. So this would be about five sheep or uh, uh, one cow or, or maybe a couple more acres per cow, depending on the weight of the animal. If we have more animal units per acre, then we don't have an adequate forage supply for the animal. And we oftentimes see this that uh, towards summer, um, because we're not managing, we're not getting the performance out of our growing animals that we might expect to get. If we have less animals, <clears throat> then what we'll see is that uh, we'll have weed problems coming into the pasture because the animals aren't able to defoliate everything and then weeds that grow taller tend to come in and take over these pastures. So uh, it is important that we be in the right stocking rate if we really want our pasture to be productive. Now here's an example then of the difference in management. If we uh, don't manage our pasture, a lot of those in the Midwest are this way, in other words they're not rotationally grazed, they're not maybe fertilized, um, and a number of other things that we could do from a management perspective. What we see is that if we put a thousand pound animal on one and a half acres, that we're not going to have enough forage there almost right from the start in the spring. Uh, we're going to need to have some additional supplement. On the other hand, if we take that same one and a half acre and fertilize it a little bit and rest it once or twice over summer, uh, we can have a surplus of forage from that acre and a half for that thousand pound animal. So the difference between these two is that on the same land unit, whether we manage or not, we can either have surplus forage or we can have a forage shortage. So what do we do to get the maximum from our pasture? Well, I'm going to talk about four things quickly, but the steps are basically uh, to control perennial weeds, to soil test and fertilize, to have a good grazing program, and then possibly to interseed grasses and legumes. And let me just start off by saying this is most commonly the question that I get asked. And my response to everyone is that unless you're going to do the first three, there's no reason to worry about seeding something. Uh, because you won't get the benefit of any seeded species unless you are controlling weeds, fertilizing, and have a good grazing program. So what does this mean? Well, <clears throat> the first thing is, is I'm not worried about a weed here and there. Uh, what we're thinking about are those areas that are overgrown, that are tall in weeds. Uh, we're thinking about areas that don't have a single weed but a whole patch of them so that the animals won't go in there to graze. You've lost that acreage and even seeding isn't going to overcome this. We need to control the weeds first. I'm not going to spend more time on that but we do have publications on control of weeds. It's important to identify the weed problem that you have and then to use the right program and timing is everything here. Uh, if you put a herbicide on at the wrong time it isn't going to be very effective. So timing is everything and the timing will depend on the weed problems that you have. The second issue then is to soil test and fertilize. And uh, we would recommend doing this on all pastures at least every three or four years. Uh, it gives you an idea of about where you are. The, I'm not going to spend time on the phosphorus and potassium and now sulfur. Most of our pastures need some sulfur. 
But the main thing is to think about nitrogen fertilization, which is a little bit different from other crops. Uh, with other crops, since we're only harvesting grain once a year, we can put the nitrogen on once, we can have it be taken up and used. But since the grass is growing and regrowing, it's important to understand that whatever nitrogen you put on early in the spring is going to be taken up and grazed, and then you're going to be short on nitrogen the next time that pasture tries to grow. So theoretically, <clears throat> we want to apply the nitrogen ahead of each growth cycle. That may not be quite practical, but I'll talk about that. But one of the ways you can tell if your nitrogen is deficient is uh, looking around the manure piles that you have in your paddocks. And if they're tall and green around the manure, just think that the rest of your pasture could be that tall and green if you fertilized it appropriately. So <clears throat> from a practical standpoint, what we're suggesting is for maximum yield, we would want an early spring fertilization of nitrogen. We'd want a mid-June fertilization of nitrogen for the summer growth, and then definitely an August 1 growth. <coughs> now from an economic standpoint, on many of our soils in the state, the mid-June one is not going to help us much because we tend to be dry over summer and not get the growth. So at least think of an early spring and an August 1 application. If we don't put on the August 1, we will get a green up in the fall, but very little tonnage and growth. So do soil test and fertilize. Do consider the need for a split application of nitrogen. Then institute a good grazing program. And we talked about stocking rates starting off, a thousand pound animal on two to four acres. The other thing is, is to have rotationally grazed areas. And I don't uh, consider that we should go into great depth on this. Uh, the maximum benefit is from moving animals daily. Uh, that may not be practical in many situations. The dairymen do this, but for other animals we may move less frequently. Uh, the main thing is to rest each area of your pasture for at least a week or two once or twice a year. Uh, that's the bottom line there. Uh, if we do that we're going to get 70 or 80 percent of the benefit compared to continuous grazing. So do institute a, a good grazing program. So it does actually vary according to plant growth and in general the rate of movement would increase. Uh, the rest period time would increase as the growth rate slows and we do need to rotate the pastures at least weekly. The reason for that is the pastures start to regrow. And if we don't move cattle or horses or sheep or whatever off the pastures, then they start regrazing those areas that had been grazed and letting the older material grow up and the weeds come out. The last thing from a pasture management standpoint is to seed improved grasses or legumes. Why would we do this? Well, one is we might want better quality grasses. Um, <clears throat> some of the um, blue grasses, some of the fescues now are better quality than some of the weedy grasses that grow out there. The other main thing is that we get a better seasonal distribution of yield. Uh, a, a lot of our pastures that have been overgrazed, first they're blue grass, which are very persistent, but they're low yielding and very drought susceptible. Uh, secondly, a lot of our pastures have a lot of quack grass in them, and those are very persistent, but they don't yield in the fall. They produce yield in the summer only. So if we want fall growth, we might want to overseed uh, some uh, orchard grass or tall fescue that will grow more in the fall. The other thing is, is we may want legumes in our pastures, and <clears throat> some areas we can keep them in very easily. But in most areas, the legumes die out in two or three years, and so we need to, continue, to continually frost seed and overseed grasses. Uh, we'll get better summer growth, we'll get higher quality forage, and the legumes will fix a little bit of nitrogen there. So what are our options? Well, one is a no-till seeding. Uh, and that simply means that we seed a grass or a legume into the existing sod with a no-till drill. We can do this very simply, very cheaply and it will improve the pasture. The key thing is to graze the grass short after seeding to help emergence. And so what we would basically recommend is that you graze or mow whenever the grass gets about 10 inches tall in that seeding year for the first 60 to 90 days. <coughs> Again, 
A lot of people think we shouldn't graze it, we shouldn't mow it, but then what happens is the grass that was there comes up and shade out what we tried to seed, and so we don't get establishment of our seeded species. The second option is a reduced tillage, and oftentimes we might want to do this where we want to level our pasture area. Perhaps uh, it's been pugged up. We have wheel or horse uh, or sh cattle uh, depressions where they've walked in areas over the years and made it rough. So we might disc it a time or two to level it. Uh, this will delay the growth of the uh, sod that is there, the bluegrass or quackgrass in all likelihood. We'd seed into that sod with a drill and again graze periodically over summer to help the emergence and establishment of our seeded species. The third choice for pasture improvement is to frost seed. And there the idea would be that, and we can do this, we most commonly do it with red clover, but we could include a little bit of orchard grass or tall fescue. The idea is to graze the pasture very short in the fall, prior to the spring that we're going to do the seeding. We actually would like some exposed soil. We'll then broadcast the seed in mid-March, which is about a month earlier than we would drill seed into the ground. And possibly this seed can be spread with fertilizer and then graze or mow whenever it gets tall. The advantages of frost seeding are cheap, it's simple, it's easy. The disadvantages is it won't work on sandy soil, so we need a soil that heaves a little bit. Um, it doesn't always work, but our data shows that about two-thirds of the time it does, and it does give a disuniform stand. We'll improve the legume or the grass percentage, <clears throat> but it's not going to be uniform across the field. So uh, our recommendation would be to seed maybe, uh, frost seed maybe two pounds of clover annually. And then if it doesn't work some year, you've lost about five bucks, but um, it's cheaper than renting a drill. So uh, it is a way to improve an existing pasture, something that many uh, pasture owners use. It is, uh, again, cheap, simple, and easy. Uh, what grasses do we seed if we're going to seed a grass? Uh, again, the clover would most likely be red clover. We'd suggest you pick a premium variety. It'll persist longer. It'll yield well. You can find that information in our variety trial update. If we're going to seed grasses, we'd probably seed orchard grass, tall fescue, or meadow fescue. We, the old standards have been brome grass and timothy, but those are not recommended. Uh, first, brome grass, because it has 60 or 70 percent of its growth in, in first cutting. So uh, if you mix it with alfalfa or a clover, you get a very grassy first cutting and a little later. But also you have less pasture than late in the season. You'd like something that yields more consistently. Same thing with timothy. It's very winter hardy, but it doesn't yield well and it has a short stand life, two to three years. So again, our recommendation is orchard grass, tall fescue, or meadow fescue. Uh, when selecting, it's important to pay as much attention to selecting a grass variety as you would a corn or a soybean crop. Uh, one of the things that we have seen is that the difference in yield of these grass varieties is up to four tons per year the difference between the top and the bottom yielding variety within the same trial. So do select a good variety and that information is available on our website or in our uh, perennial variety update. Pay attention to varieties. So four tons right now at $200 a ton, it's worth an extra 50 cents a pound for the seed. Now, in addition to yield, you want to look at winter hardiness of orchard grass and tall fescue. Here's an example of our orchard grass variety trials. And I think if you had a pasture, you'd rather, you'd rather have this variety right here than the one on either side of it. <laughs> this one isn't going to grow very well in the spring. This one will survive. It will come in, but it's going to be very low yielding. This one and this one, for all practical purposes, are dead. So we do want winter hardy types that we need for here. We also want rust resistance. Rust is a fungus that grows on the grass. And some varieties have genetic resistance and the cheapest ones do not. Now, rust is important because it gives us more yield, but more imp importantly, the animals don't like rust infected grass and so they won't eat it as well. Um, and so you can see where here's a rust resistant variety, here's a rust susceptible variety, 
and here's a plant from within there. We do want rust resistant orchard grass, tall fescue, and meadow fescue. Here's some of my plots. You can see the resistant varieties back here versus the susceptible ones up front. We also want late maturing types. Uh, the early maturing types are the cheap seed. The late maturing types are a little bit more expensive, but the late maturing types will head closer to when the uh, red clover or the alfalfa he heads and will yield more in the fall period. So again, we'd like late maturing types. And there's almost a, a month difference in yield between this earliest one and the latest one. A month difference in heading. So we'd like something in this mid to late period that will head in uh, mid to late May rather than the early heading types, which again, the early heading types tend to be the cheapest seed. So as we're uh, looking at pasture management, we have this information and others on our website. Uh, the variety selection is important for either alfalfa, clovers, or grasses. And that variety information is available in our UW Extension Forage publication or available on the Team Forage website or on my website. Thank you. Thank you.